Good evening and thanks for joining us. This is NTD Business and I'm Paul Graney. Three big tech CEOs were in the hot seat today. A Senate committee wants to know if the Communications Decency Act has outlived its usefulness. A former Hunter Biden business partner raises concerns about the family's business relationship with China. He even claims the former vice president could be compromised because of his family's business history. A look at the next generation of diamond displays and how China's Huawei tried to steal the technology. And are you thinking of starting a business? What about mining asteroids? One expert says it's a lucrative gig. With just six days to go until the election, President Trump spoke in Las Vegas today. He's holding two rallies in Arizona as well, a crucial battleground state. Former Vice President Joe Biden's running mate Kamala Harris is also in Arizona. But Biden, he cast his early vote today in his hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. He joined over 74 million Americans who've already voted. We begin tonight by looking at tech companies' role in controlling what information we see and whether they have the power to influence the election. The CEOs of Google, Facebook and Twitter were in front of Congress today. They testified before the Senate Commerce Department, the Senate Commerce Committee on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 means platforms aren't responsible for the content users post on them. For example, if a user posts something false that damages someone else's reputation, the platform, like Twitter, isn't held accountable. The user is held accountable because platforms say they can't control the content that others publish. But some lawmakers, especially Republicans, say these platforms are controlling what appears on their sites by censoring certain people or content. Now they want a review of Section 230. If it were appealed, platforms may be responsible for every piece of content posted. It completely changed the way social media works. Three of Silicon Valley's biggest tech CEOs testified before the Senate on Wednesday. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, Jack Dorsey of Twitter and Sundar Pichai of Google were questioned about how they manage political content. That includes how political ads are managed to moderating user posts on their platforms. Section 230 was introduced in 1996. It currently shields platforms from liability for content posted on their platforms. Some say that ending 230 would solve all of the Internet's problems. Others say that it would end the Internet as we know it. The likelihood of fully repealing Section 230 seems remote. Modifications to the current definition of the law would be more likely and easier to implement. Of the three CEOs, Mark Zuckerberg seemed most willing to discuss it. But the Internet has also evolved, and I think that Congress should update the law to make sure that it's working as intended. The bill has bipartisan support. Republican Senator Roger Wicker, who chaired the hearing, says big tech is censoring conservative views. Democrats often say that we don't remove enough content, and Republicans often say we remove too much. Wicker brought up that Twitter hasn't blocked the Iranian dictator for hate speech, including posts where he said the Holocaust didn't happen. Yet Twitter took down President Trump's tweet recently saying mail-in voting isn't trustworthy. Senator Ted Cruz recently said Twitter is interfering in the election by blocking certain posts. He asked Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey about it. Does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? No. You don't believe Twitter has any ability to influence elections? No. Regardless of the election results, it seems that changes to Section 230 will likely be under further review at some point. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And then a pretty shocking interview last night. Hunter Biden's former business partner said Joe Biden is compromised by communist China. Tony Bobulinski says he worked on a deal between a major Chinese energy company and the Biden family. He said the vice president was directly involved in the project and even had an equity stake in it. This is big news because Biden has always said he never discussed business with his son Hunter. Bobulinski says he's coming forward now because Biden called Bobulinski's account of what happened Russian disinformation. Bobulinski is a Navy veteran and says he's sickened that anyone would accuse him of working against the United States. 
A former business partner of Hunter Biden said Joe Biden and his family are compromised because of business dealings with China. Tony Bobolinsky made the claim in an interview with Fox News aired on Tuesday night. He is a former business partner of Hunter Biden, the former vice president's son. Bobolinsky told Tucker Carlson, quote, I just don't see, given the history here and the facts, how Joe can't be influenced in some manner based on the history that they have with CEFC. CEFC was a Chinese oil conglomerate. It's now defunct. Its chairman, Ye Jianming, had close ties with high-level Chinese officials and was once touted as the Rockefeller of China. Corporate documents obtained by the Epoch Times, now made public, show in 2017 Hunter Biden, James Biden, the former vice president's brother, Bobolinsky, and two other partners formed a joint venture with CEFC's Ye. It's called Sinohawk and was formed in Delaware. Bobolinsky was the CEO of this joint venture. Joe Biden has denied involvement in his son's business dealings. His name also didn't appear in any of the corporate records disclosed by Bobolinsky. But Bobolinsky told Fox News the Biden family name was one of the key offerings from Hunter Biden and his partners for the joint venture. A 2017 business proposal prepared for CEFC features a photo of Joe Biden with then-president of Colombia. Bobolinsky also said he had two in-person meetings with Joe Biden because he was taking on the role of Cinehawk's CEO. Bobolinsky entered the public eye last week when he made public his work with the Bidens. He said he wanted to come forward publicly to clear his family name. The earlier New York Post stories were called Russian disinformation. The reports disclosed emails allegedly from Hunter Biden's laptop. Hunter Biden or the Joe Biden campaign have responded to our, our request for comment yet. U.S. Talks stocks tumbled today. All three indexes closed at least 3% lower. The Dow fell over 943 points, it's about 3.43%. S&P 500 lost nearly 120 points or 3.53%. The high-flying Nasdaq dropped over 426 points, 3.73%. What a rout. Shares of hotels, airlines all sank. Big tech stocks even weighed down the S&P. GE was the one bright spot. It jumped 8%. It posted a surprise quarterly profit. It's the largest percentage gainer on the entire S&P. An American company has just unveiled a new diamond-coated display that you might find on your next phone or smartwatch. A can semiconductor CEO says you shouldn't need a cover or case to protect your phone for everyday use. He says their new display is three times tougher than the new iPhone 12 display. And I think what makes it even more interesting is just last year, China's Huawei tried to steal the technology from Akon. I asked Adam Khan about it, about their new glass and the Huawei incident. So yesterday we announced our third party test results around our Mirage Diamond Glass. Uh, this is the material that goes for your uh, favorite smartphone display, your favorite smartwatch display, uh, even all the way up to 8K TV uh, home panel display. And as you know from having a phone, uh, every time you drop it, uh, every time you throw it in your bag, there's propensity to have cracks um, and for potential breakage. So our material was announced yesterday to be over three times harder than the latest uh, Corning Ceramic Shield technology the one that's going on the brand new iPhone 12. And the idea here is, again, we're spending so much on these devices, they should be resilient, robust enough to handle uh, everyday use, and should not have to have uh, an additional cover on it, an additional phone encasing to make it survive everyday usage. And so this brings the uh, strength and performance of Diamond, and of course the aesthetic beauty uh, of Diamond to your smartphone screen. Incredible. And what did you guys do to get here? How did you innovate? So, uh, as you may have seen, uh, since 2016 in uh, announcing our intention to go into this market, we've been working with all of the world's uh, top OEMs. Uh, perhaps most notably, uh, last year, the incident with Huawei uh, was actually uh, quite surprising for us in that we know uh, Huawei to be a major OEM. Their interest in diamond uh, and diamond-like carbon materials for their phone screen uh, actually solidified our intention to bring this out for the rest of the market. And so uh, in looking at this material and understanding you know, its ability to scale up for mass production, the disruption it can bring to the smartphone display market, um, we were very uh, resilient in our approach and are happy to say now it's ready for mass commercial scaling. And tell me a little bit about the Huawei story. Maybe you can introduce our, our viewers to what exactly happened. 
Sure. Uh, so around the 2017-2018 uh, timeframe, uh, Huawei and their U.S. subsidiary, uh, subsidiary uh, Huawei Device USA, had reached out to us, seeing some of our uh, press materials, hearing some of our academic talks uh, around diamond, uh, diamond-based optics. And so uh, Huawei had reached out with the intention, uh, alongside the other OEMs, to exclusively use this technology. And so we had proceeded in good faith in sending some of our data, sending some earlier prototypes with the caveat that because this is an export restricted material, they could not leave uh, stateside testing facilities. And unfortunately, uh, as the news had reported, uh, Huawei had exported it to China and had attempted to reverse engineer the technology, uh, exposing it to a high energy cutting laser to try to center off a piece to reverse uh, the chemical composition. And so we received the piece back in uh, a clearly cut up fashion, uh, which we were surprised because it being diamond glass, it's virtually impossible to break the material. And so uh, we'd actually worked with the FBI uh, to uh, pursue this case against Huawei, and we were able to capture uh, both the audio and video of them admitting, you know, they willfully ignored uh, export and control law in doing this, and of course violated the covenant of our business agreement. And so for our purposes, of course, we were shocked, you know, this being such a major company and, you know, one of the, one of the five largest telecoms in the world uh, and operating such nefarious behavior uh, you know, it took us back. But I'm happy to say that, you know, we were able to accelerate our efforts. We've introduced this latest blend into the market and we're far ahead positionally of, I think, where they can be. Just incredible. They talk about IP theft in China, but this brings it to a whole new level. This is smash and grab type stuff. Is it just incredible? Adam, I want to ask you as well, we had a big news yesterday about AMD buying uh, Xilinx. I wanted to ask you, I was curious, I thought of you as soon as I saw the news. I wanted to ask, how will it change the, the landscape, the semiconductor landscape? Well, it's interesting because this, I think, sort of parallels nicely off the uh, proposed uh, NVIDIA ARM deal. Uh, similar to that deal, we have uh, AMD, who's, of course, known well as a CPU company, as a strong competitor to Intel. And now we have Xilinx, which is an FPGA company, the Field Programmable Gate Array. And so here we have uh, a nice opportunity for AMD to be extremely competitive, potentially with this new NVIDIA stack up, but also for them to get into markets which aren't traditional high-power graphics uh, computing like laptops. Top. With the FPGA, not only will they have access to mobile, but a lot of technologies, you know, such as defense and aerospace technologies, where these type of components, FPGAs, are quite critical. Um, so we're very excited about this deal, and of course, this comes alongside a lot of the uh, market announcements in semiconductor. Um, so it's quite a time for M&A and semiconductor over here. So many changes. Adam, really appreciate it. Pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Paul. And Harley Davidson is trying to appeal to younger riders by starting an e-bike brand. The iconic motorcycle company has revealed the first images of its future electric bike called Serial One. The bike will have a mid-mounted engine that kicks in when the rider turns the pedals. The top speed will be limited at 28 miles an hour because of e-bike regulations. Harley's been having a rough time, of course, with its motorcycle branch. Its profits are down for the past six years. The company then took, of course, a heavy hit from the pandemic, but it did say its profits rose in the past three months. Serial One will be a joint venture with investors, with Harley-Davidson being a minority shareholder. The new e-bike will be on the market in the first half of next year. And a NASA just found a new asteroid full of rare Earth metals. Big business if you can get to it. I talked to the author of Winning Space, Brandon Waychart. He told me the U.S. government is constantly eliminating regulations to allow for the development of this space economy. I asked him when I could become a space entrepreneur then. He said right away. Maybe something like space, to space tourism or space mining. That space mining sounded pretty cool. I asked him what the space industry is worth right now. We're talking about a minimum of $1 trillion economy. It's considerably more. Right now, NASA's inspecting an asteroid that is worth 400, uh, no, 700 quadrillion, uh, quadrillion dollars. It's full of gold and other rare earth minerals. The Chinese have, an, have announced uh, their intention to basically strip mine the moon, the asteroid belt, and any uh, uh, celestial body that they can get to that has uh, rare earth minerals, things that we need to build modern technology. Uh, and the Chinese in particular have a concerted strategy for mining for these, these, uh, these commodities in space. It also shows 
Uh, we've seen what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, and in Africa with trying to get a hold of the natural resources there. Imagine that applied to space. And so the space mining industry, I think, for the world is going to be the most lucrative, but uh, concomitant with that will be space tourism uh, and uh, these sort of uh, private uh, small startups like SpaceX in the private space launch industry. And that's going to, those are the areas that we really are going to see leaps and bounds of advances in. It's incredible. And on the mining side, what is it, first yeah. come, first served? How do you lay claim to an asteroid? Well, well, so this is the this is one of the things that the Trump administration has been trying to work out with the Artemis Accords for the moon, for instance, because basically the international legal system does not technically allow uh, a, a country or a private company to claim territory on, in, in space. What it does allow, though, there's a gray area, is you can land on an object and harvest resources from it, and the resources you've harvested from it, you can commoditize and sell. And that is what the Chinese want to do. That's what the president wants to make it possible for us to do in America. Um, I was working on the Hill in 2014, and we passed the, uh, the, I believe it was the Launch Act, and that basically said that any American company that can get to an asteroid can lay claim to the resources there. And again, that's a you know quadrillions worth uh, economy waiting to be had. The experts say that the first trillionaire in the world will come from the space mining sector. Incredible. And is this where the Space Force comes in in case there's Star Wars over this mining or different things that happen yeah. there? Well, wow. the Space Force, yeah, the, the Space Force, uh, you know, the flag often follows trade. And so the Space Force is going to need to be up there because we're going to have problems with uh, sort of the legal jurisdiction. So you can imagine things, and this is not a joke, you can imagine things like space piracy going on. We've seen the rise of private military contractors with a lot of technology today operating in what we would call the third world. They're going to also eventually have access to satellites, attack satellites, um, and eventually they'll have personnel in space, just like the military and private sector will. And so we're going to need a space force to secure the, the, the shipping lanes, if you will, in space the same way that we rely on the U.S. Navy uh, to secure the sea routes today. What a time to be alive. Brandon, really yeah. appreciate it. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. So awesome. Still to come this evening. Krispy Kreme offers a sweet reward for completing your civic duty. We have details on how you can participate. With more of us working from home this year, we're also spending more on the home office. Find out if you can deduct those costs when we return. Welcome back. Krispy Kreme is offering voting incentives this year. Now nah, they're not getting political, they're just giving away free donuts on election day. All you have to do is visit your local Krispy Kreme on November 3rd and you'll get a free glazed donut. Don't worry if you voted early, you won't be turned away or even asked for proof that you voted. you also get a free I Voted sticker. Sounds like a pretty good reward for mailing in your ballot or braving lines on election day. And if you're working from home, chances are you've spent some money to make your work life a little easier. So can you deduct those expenses? Here's some answers. It's the safest place to work, according to many health experts. If you have the option to have employees work at home, if you have that option yourself, uh, it's a great way to reduce your own risk as well as the risk to others. If you've bought supplies, a desk, chair, or shelled out for a better internet connection to make work from home easier, you may be wondering if you're able to take the home office tax deduction for those expenses on your 2020 federal tax return. The short answer is... Probably not. The people most likely to be eligible for a deduction are those who are self-employed, 
But even then, they have to meet certain rules. If you work full-time for someone else, you're out of luck. The IRS noted last month that employees who receive a paycheck or W-2 exclusively from an employer are not eligible for the deduction, even if they're currently working from home. But there's good news for employees living in Alabama, Arkansas, California, Hawaii, Minnesota, New York, and Pennsylvania. These seven states let their residents deduct unreimbursed employee business expenses on their state income tax returns. Just be sure to check the instructions for your return because each state may have different rules regarding how much unreimbursed expenses qualify. Experts say you can just ask your employer if he'll reimburse you directly for your home office expenses. But at the moment, only 38% of employers say they're doing so, as according to one consulting firm. And still to come, a Scottish scientist showcases his unconventional fuel. Being Scottish, it involves whiskey. Will it become the way of the future? And a luxury hotel in Taiwan offers guests a very unique experience. Ocean lovers take note, it could be one for the bucket list. More on that when we return. Welcome back. A Scottish scientist has found a new way to fuel your car. He's using the waste from whiskey making. It creates fuel that help you get across town. Professor Martin Tangney founded Celtic Renewables in 2012. He says less than 10% of what comes out of a distillery is actually used in the final product. The rest is unwanted residues. His company makes biofuel out of it called biobutanol. It's touted as an alternative to gas and diesel fuel. The factory that we're now building is our first. It will be at commercial scale and will process about 50,000 tonnes of organic residues a year, mainly from the Scottish whisky industry. But we can process other residues and it is our ambition to do this. Three years ago, Tangney showcased the fuel's efficiency by filling a car with it and driving around a university parking lot. He says the companies raised nearly $40 million in funding. It just launched a funding campaign and members of the public can buy shares in the company. Everybody really had a good look at themselves during uh, COVID and the lockdown. And I feel like coming out of this, people realize there is a different world. We can do things differently and there is a need and a desire to bring in a sustainable bioeconomy. Local whiskey distilleries give the company their raw waste materials inexpensively or even for free. It cuts down on disposal costs for them, which can be expensive. It's a model he hopes to expand globally. Our real ambition is to take this at much bigger scale and build factories like this all over Scotland, all over the UK and all over the world. Tangney estimates they could eventually produce about 13 million gallons of biofuel each year, just with the whiskey waste available in Scotland. If you're a fan of the ocean, you'll like this one. A hotel and aquarium in Taiwan have teamed up to give guests their own sea life experience. As penguins swim through these tunnels, diners in the cafe below can watch their antics. Sharks and colorful fish in the main tank catch the attention of visitors. X Park Aquarium shares the same infrastructure as Cozy Blue Luxury Hotel next door. A night at the hotel includes access to X Park. Our hotel was designed following the ideas of the French novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Therefore, we can see marine navigation themed elements, such as the jellyfish shaped and shell shaped lamps. Apart from that, when we walk into a bedroom, we see a display of paintings on the wall that suggest views from a submarine porthole. There is even the opportunity to see the aquarium without leaving the room. One channel on the TV provides a real-time view of the main tank. We can see that every corner of the hotel is decorated with marine-related elements. Each of our bedrooms is equipped with a 65-inch TV screen, showing us real-time images from inside a fish tank. Such as here, we see sharks and manta rays swimming smoothly. Staff dive in to maintain the aquarium, and shoals of fish swim past the camera. One of the main attractions is the penguins. Visitors can watch them swim in their tanks. 
They vanish down one hole only to emerge from another. The aquarium has also installed a system of transparent tunnels that run through the cafe. The birds can swim and play in them while diners watch below. The park hopes these tunnels will be a new way to learn about penguins. That's all the business updates for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.